This conference will now be recorded. Okay. So I um, wanted to let everyone know that we will be taking attendance today through the chat box. So uh, please uh, find the chat box, which looks like a little conversation bubble on your screen. And uh, let us know that you're here. Uh, type your name and your affiliation into the chat box. Um, also a reminder that we would like everyone to stay on mute. And it looks like everyone has muted themselves. I think this is a reflection of the fact that we've been doing a lot of these meetings and we know what the background noise sounds like. So thank you all for muting yourselves. Um, however, after the presentation that we have today and during some of the discussion, there will be plenty of opportunity um, for conversation. So at that time, you can unmute yourself and participate in the conversation. Um, I do want to also note that uh, you can use the chat box to submit your questions for the speakers or any um, any part of the conversation. I will be trying to keep an eye on that. And I think we've got other Timacog staff on the, on the line who can also keep an eye on the chat box. Uh, one important note about the chat box that you may not be aware of um, is that it actually, the file from the chat will download to your own computer. So anything that is in the chat box will be saved to a Word document on your computer. And that'll be under your My Documents folder. So uh, just be aware of that and also be aware that that does constitute a public record. So with that, I think that's all the announcements that I have uh, right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to our chair, John Eckel and vice chair, Melissa Green. Oh, thank you so much, Kari. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for tuning into our meeting today, uh, both uh, regular members and hopefully some guests. Uh, to recap a little bit, we had our last water quality council meeting was May 11th. And we had Mayor Mike Snyder from Port Clinton uh, talk to us about the high water levels and the effect on his community and Ottawa County in general. Uh, that, that is, as Kari noted, available uh, to view on the website. Uh, I want you to know that the Water Quality Council is busy. The committees are all working hard. The staff, uh, second to none, as always, uh, on May 20th. Uh, Kari and I attended an executive committee meeting on June 17th. We had the board of trustee meeting. Uh, so business is being done. Everything is moving forward. Uh, and as a note to that, I will tell you all, I miss you terribly. Uh, I, will, I will chime in Kari right now and say, I think this is a great tool, but I just find it so hard to network and the camaraderie and uh, all, all the great personal relationships that I can't enjoy through a cell phone. Um, but nonetheless, we're here and we're getting things done. So I look so forward to seeing all of you, uh, hopefully early 2021. Uh, today, we got uh, great presentations by uh, Sally, John and Kelly. Uh, looking forward to hearing that. At the end of the presentation, We'll have about 10 minutes so people can uh, call in or call in or get questions answered uh, by the uh, by the speakers. Uh, we are going to limit it to 10 minutes so that we can move the program on and get everybody back to what they're doing. Uh, once again, thank you so much for attending. Uh, on May 11th, I believe we had 37 people tune in, and I hope we can uh, best that number today. Uh, with that. I'm going to turn it over to the vice chair, Melissa Greenhofer, and she will give the bios for our very astute speakers today. Thank you, John. Yes, yeah, so I have the uh, privilege today of uh, introducing our speakers. We're going to hear about the Cullen Park and Grassy Island uh, Wetland Restoration Project. Uh, we're going to hear from Sally Gladwell, uh, John Kushner, and Kelly Hancock. And I'm just gonna give a little background on the three of them real quick, and then we'll hand it over to them. Uh, Sally Gladwell is a senior vice president and principal for the Mannequin Smith Group. She has more than 28 years of experience in the environmental field, focused on urban revitalization, environmental due diligence, natural resource restoration, and sustainability. She is a certified professional or a certified professional with Ohio EPA's Voluntary Action Program, and through her keen problem-solving skills and creativity, she has worked with diverse project teams to develop projects that transform underutilized land. 
committed to community-wide revitalization, Sally has organized and hosted workshops to explore funding opportunities for brownfield revitalization in Ohio, as well as a half-day brownfield leadership summit held at the University of Toledo uh, commenced with opening remark that commenced with opening remarks from the mayor of Toledo and featuring a keynote address by a national expert on urban revitalization. John Kushner uh, has more than 30 years of experience providing ecological, environmental, and uh, NEPA-related consulting services to clients in the private and public sector. Throughout his career, John has coordinated and or authored many Ohio Department of Transportation and local public agency-sponsored ecological surveys, waterways permit applications, wetland mitigation projects, and categorical exclusions. He has also directed several large-scale GIS-based watershed studies, including the Wetland and Riparian Inventory and Restoration Plan Development Project for Swan, Cre Swan Creek and Ottawa River. The Ottawa River Habitat Restoration Inventory and the Duck and Otter Creeks Habitat Inventory and Restoration Project. And then Kelly Hancock, uh, she is the Director of Public Relations at Heart. She has provided strategic PR counsel and tactical support to clients across a number of industries, including several public works projects. Some of those include Ohio Department of Transportation and City of Toledo uh, for its Toledo Waterways Initiative and water treatment plant upgrades, as well as the Maumee Watershed Conservancy District for Hancock County flood risk reduction efforts. She also has counseled Imagination Station, the Toledo Zoo, and TARDA on messaging development, media relations, and social media outreach and crisis planning. So three very impressive uh, resumes and folks that we're gonna hear from. And I will go ahead and hand it over to Sally, John, and Kelly. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, John. And I also wanna thank Joe Cappell from the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority, whose idea it was to uh, present today to the Water Quality Council, knowing that we've got a group of um, folks who are already keyed into water quality issues and hoping to give you an opportunity to see where we're at with these two projects and to have a little dialogue afterwards, um, as John suggested. So um, with that, uh, Kelly, are you okay advancing the slides? Great. So here's an overview of what we're going to try to cover in the next 35 minutes. Um, the, some of the, the H2 Ohio program overview, I'll be very brief because I know most, if not all of you are already familiar with it, but then we will go uh, take a deeper dive into these two projects, the Cullen Park and the Grassy Island Wetland Restoration Projects, which are um, really pretty closely linked, but they are being um, managed as two separate projects under two separate contracts, both funded by the H2 Ohio program. And then we'll look at the status of where each of those are because they did start on different time frames, so the, um, the schedules are a little bit different. We'll look closely at the project schedule so you can see exactly where we're at with those. Talk more in, in detail about um, long-term monitoring and how um, that we plan to deliver the water quality benefits as part of these projects. And then also talk importantly about community engagement because we know that's a really important facet of these projects. And, and for that reason, we're very happy to have Hart on our team. So that's what we're gonna to cover today. Before I move on, are there any questions about the agenda for today? Okay, if not, then we'll hold up uh, questions as John suggested till the, till the very end. Thanks Kelly for advancing. Um, we are very happy to uh, be working with a group of really talented stakeholders, not just our client, the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority, but also ODNR through the Office of Coastal Management using funding from H2 Ohio, and then um, project support provided by the city of Toledo as well. Uh, so um, project being steer steered by a group of really talented folks. We are happy to have on our consultant team, Limnotech, who's handling um, some hydraulic modeling for us. Uh, Stone Environmental, who's gonna be handling some of the ecological tasks along with us. And then as I mentioned before, Hart, um, to lead the community engagement piece. Next slide. We have talked at the Water Quality Council quite a few times about the H2 Ohio program, the, um, what it's intended to cover, and the organizing um, agencies that are helping to implement the, the funding. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here, but just as a refresher, 
there's three basic um, mechanisms for using the funding or agencies through which the funding is, is being um, administered. And that's the Ohio Department of Agriculture, the um, DNR, and then also Ohio EPA. And so we're working, um, as I mentioned before, with ODNR on this project through the Office of Coastal Management, and they're providing support for um, creating, or in this case, restoring wetlands. Next slide. Um, because this is uh, funded by H2 Ohio and because of the sensitive area that these projects are located in, water quality improvements are our primary goal for both of these projects. Objectives to support that goal um, include you know, our ways to, to improve water quality will be to reduce phosphorus levels in the bay water, as well as reducing the near shore wave action that's contributing to coastal erosion and therefore um, release of more, more phosphorus and, and sediment. Um, we want to improve the ecology of the bay by um, creating and enhancing and restoring some of the lost habitat there in terms of um, aquatic and um, flora, species and flora and fauna. And then we recognize that this is a really important part of our community in terms of recreation, both in water and on land. Um, I, I don't know if everyone knows this, but in the city of Toledo, Cullen Park is the only, and, and this day, it's the only publicly owned land in Toledo with direct access to Lake Erie. That makes it a really important resource for us and one that we want to take care of. And, um, and one that we want to help, you know, buoy, if you will, the recreational opportunities that already exist there and help enhance them. So things like fishing, paddle sports, birding, boating. Next slide, please. This map gives you a general overview of where the two project areas are located. So, um, and it may be a little difficult to see on your screens, depending on how large of a screen you have right now, but I would say that the southern one, the one that's located right in the bay, that's the Cullen Park Wetland Restoration Project area. And then the one that's adjacent to the, the jetty there and the Grassy Island, that's what's being referred to as the Grassy Island Wetland Project. So. As I mentioned before, the projects are so closely linked, not just by their goal and their objectives, but also by proximity. And so we're, um, although they're on slightly different schedules with, um, in some cases, slightly different tasks, in large part, many overlapping tasks and activities. So um, we're trying to realize those efficiencies wherever we can, um, recognizing that there are two, there's some site specificity to each one of those. And with that, I will um, turn it over to John Kushner to talk a little bit uh, more deeply in detail about the projects. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sally. Can you all hear me? Can, okay, good. Thank you. Because I, I had some technical difficulties. Uh, you'd think after four and a half months of the pandemic, I'd learn how to use this technology. But unfortunately, it's pretty sketchy. But uh, it's good to see you all, even though you're on camera. Uh, it's been a while. Um, the Cullen Park Bay um, project, I want to make one thing. Uh, you know, this is the larger green area that you see there is really our entire study area. And so what we are doing there is we are evaluating different types and sizes and positions of wetlands within that 140 acre study area that will intercept some of the water, obviously not all of it. There is a there is some water that comes into there from the Maumee River. A lot of it does go by and it goes up through the jet, between the jetty and Grassy Island. And that's where the Grassy Island portion of the project will help take care of more of the water. But we're trying to position and size and design wetlands within that green area there that will help us achieve our goals and objectives, okay? And we're going to do that um, with being sensitive to a number of the public concerns that we've already heard. One is, I don't know if many of you know this or not, and if you're a boater, you will. If you're not, you may not. There is a dredge channel that runs from Cullen Park Bay Boat Launch pretty much down the green side, the just on the other side of that green line that between the jetty 
and the in our area. We're going to maintain that channel and we're going to create a few other channels through this project area so that we have we enhance the flow of water through and so that the water will get into these wetland cells that we're designing. Um, the other thing that we heard, the other concern that we heard from the public that was very important to them is they really like, a lot of people like the open expansive view of the bay as they look out from say Summit Street and the park. Um, the wetlands that we're currently intending to design will be submerged and floating leaved wetland systems with a bit of emergent edge. Um, we need, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but basically, our intent is not to create large obtrusive islands or dikes or berms that will obstruct that view shed. And uh, so what, how are we going to design these? Some of the things that are very important here are um, we need to limit wave action and we need to prolong retention times in order to reduce turbidity in the water and allow for photosynthesis to occur so that we can grow the aquatic vegetation. So we're using this larger area to create these different shapes of wetlands. And um, once we get those, we're going to be doing some uh, modeling. We've laid out some preliminary concepts already, but we haven't run them through modeling with Limnotech. But once we do that, we'll be able to sort of refine that design. And so you will see um, a concept plan that will have been vetted through some hydraulic modeling uh, to see what we're actually going to come up with. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as I said, um, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but we, we did do some original. So I don't know if you remember this or not, but we were tasked prior to H2 Ohio funding to design some wetland islands that would improve habitat for fish and, and birds and so on, and also create some areas that people could paddle in and around and so on, but they were relatively small features. Uh, when H2 Ohio came along, ODNR approached us and said, we'd really like you to expand these to help improve water quality. And as I said before, in order to do that, we need larger wetland areas that quiet the water, that create the, subs the uh, clear water, clearer water, excuse me, to reduce turbidity and grow plants. Um, some of the things we're going to look at once we have this arrangement uh, run through the modeling itself, we're going to look at the flow dynamics so that we can see how the water moves through that area into the wetlands. We're going to evaluate and estimate nutrient uptake efficiencies and primarily uh, particulate phosphorus. We're going to look at wave attenuation and erosion. We're going to definitely have to um, evaluate these wetlands for constructability. Um, and that means, you know, we're going to bring some contractors in and we're going to, we're going to say, okay, how, how do you build these? How do you actually construct them? We've got a design. We want to work with you so that they can be easily constructed. And we also want to look at them from a long-term sustainability point of view. Part of that um, task um, means that we're also going to uh, create an operations and maintenance plan that will be um, implemented down the road once they're constructed for invasive species management, um, erosion control, if we start to see certain things happening out there that we need to correct, and so on. So those are, in a nutshell, the factors that we're going to look at as we evaluate our layout. Next slide, please. So what's next for the Cullen Park Wetland Project is once the hydraulic modeling and hydrologic modeling are completed, we're going to see if we need to modify our designs, the shapes, the locations, the sizes. And once we get that done, we're going to uh, share our initial recommendations with the public, and this will coincide I looked at the schedule and it should coincide with the public meeting that we're going to have for Grassy Island. So we'll be, we'll really be talking about, at, at least the intent now is to talk about both of those projects at one public meeting event that will be held later this year. Once we have input from the public and, and so on, we will um, implement our final design plans and specifications. 
And then we always, you know, the big issue here will be having to go through Section 404, 401 permitting with the Corps of Engineers and Ohio EPA. There's uh, ODNR coastal zone management permits that need to be obtained as well. Um, there will have to be a search for additional funding for construction. And then once funding is secured, the project will go out for bid and would be constructed. So that is the a recap or a uh, summary basically of what's still left to do with the Cullen Park Wetland Project. Next slide. So the Grassy Island Project, um, similarly, that large study area is basically where we're going to place wetlands, channels, maintain, we're going to maintain the boat channel that is dredged through there, or if not maintain the exact location, we may reroute it a little bit within that area so that we ensure that we have boat passage through there. But if we can, if we can move it a little bit to increase the efficiency of our wetland performance, we may relocate it, reroute it a little bit. Um, and so I don't want anybody to misunderstand that this entire green area is going to be completely choked in with wetland vegetation. That's not the case. Okay. Here we have, oh, that's fine. I think, uh, again, the natural, um, the, the idea here, again, similar to Cullen Park Bay, is to allow for the water to flow through there and to um, enter into these wetland cells for treatment, for reduction in turbidity, um, dropping out of particulate phosphorus and um, being up, those nutrients being taken up by the uh, wetland vegetation. One thing about this side that's a little different than Cullen Park Bay is while most of the winds and the water does flow up as those arrows show, there are occasions, and it's not 50-50, it's probably le it's less than that, where we'll get a northeast wind and the water blows back through the other way. So we're gonna to have to account for the bi-directional flow of water, predominantly from the southwest or from the south to the north, but sometimes from the north to the south. Next slide, please. So to date for this particular project, the bathymetric surveys have been completed and we've pretty much laid out the topography of the bottom surface of the lake in this area. It's very, very flat. And as we said before, by recontouring the bottom um, and using the dredge sediments that are there, our goal is to balance the site so that whatever we take out to create deeper pools in that area, we will be using in that area to create some of the higher areas with uh, elevations to create these different zones of wetland plants. And then um, we're going to use that bathymetric survey to develop our basic designs. Again, course shapes, arrangements, um, sizes, look at flow dynamics, look at wave attenuation, look at the ability to sequester nutrients, uh, constructability and long-term sustainability, and um, and then again, share that with the public. Uh, Kelly's gonna talk a little more about the website that Hart has been developing and the email address that we're going to be providing with that to encourage public comments to come in to our project team. Next slide. Um, some more about our future activities. We're gonna model these forms. Um, we're going to analyze some of the alternatives, share the findings with the public, come up with the preferred design, complete those plans, have another public meeting. This, this project has a second public meeting associated with it, and then we would move on to secure funding for construction. Next slide. Here is a, um, I apologize for the scale of this, but we tried to get both project schedules onto one sheet, and you can see that if everything goes super well and the Corps of Engineers and Ohio EPA are, are uh, the permitting process goes as as anticipated, we think we can have our scope for prepared or I'm sorry, we could have regulatory permits done perhaps by August, September of next year for the Cullen Park Bay project. 
Um, but the Grassy Island Wetland Project does extend out into uh, 2022. We started that project a little later. Uh, there's a bit more in there as far as scope and public engagement. Um, and so that one does extend out a little further into 2022. Next slide. So as I talked a little bit before about this, you know, these are complex systems hydraulically. There's a lot of changing lake levels. I mean, everybody knows that last year and even into this year, we were, were somewhat near record high what lake levels. We have the sesh effect where water moves back and forth depending on which way the wind's blowing. We have the, cons, uh, the confluence with the Maumee River and so on. So it's going to be really critical to model this so that we can we can base our decisions on shapes, sizes, and locations of wetlands on, on some performance, uh, some idea of how these wetlands are going to perform. So we're, like Hart with public involvement, we're very fortunate to have Limnotech on board who had, they have actually done a lot of modeling in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. And so we're, we feel good that whatever decisions we make are going to be based on some good good data some good modeling so that we can make some good decisions on how to design these these features next slide um, we feel and odnr feels that both of the sites have great potential for capturing phosphorus uh, but obviously we want to make sure and again goes toward the modeling we don't want to be hydraulically short circuiting and just rushing water through these areas we really have to capture and retain and slow down the water as they move through these wetlands so that we can get the particulates to drop out, we can get some nutrient uptake, and we can actually see some real benefits. Next slide. This is just a little graphical representation that Limnotech ran initially on um, to show how the modeling in some general way is gonna work. Obviously, it'll be more complex than this, but. The red shows where the fastest, the deep red, the deep brown show where the fastest currents are. And obviously everybody knows um, a lot of the water does run through and goes right out to the bay, but there is a portion that does get captured in that channel. And then it backflows into the bay and it backflows up through uh, Grassy Island. And so you can see this is sort of like the baseline condition. Now, if you take the next slide, you can see how putting obstructions in there, and this is a highly schematic view of what this looks like, but you can start putting in different shapes of things, and you can see what happens to the velocity of the water, the directions of flow, and so on. This is in a general way. This shows you sort of a general depiction of what we're going to be doing as we evaluate these different wetland shapes. Next slide. The real key to the success of this thing in part is going to be measuring you know what are the water quality benefits from this and so limnotech is working and and i believe um sally if you could help me on this because i'm uh, there's a university is it ohio state do you know it's kent state kent state i'm sorry there you go um that's right i I thought Kent State initially, but I thought, oh, they're way over to the Northeast Ohio. They're not going to be coming over here. But yes, Kent State. Anyways, there is a plan for Kent State University to be involved in nutrient modeling in the Bay before and after construction so that we can actually see whether our modeling results are going, you know, going to be, um, you know, how accurate they are going to be. And we're going to be monitoring turbidity as well, or they will. Next slide. Okay, um, I'm going to turn it over now to Kelly, who will talk to you about our community engagement efforts and plan. Yeah, thanks, John. So, um, you know, I think one thing that's unique about this project is that um, it, it's close proximity to a residential area, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, to both of these projects actually, um, is how they're, they're right there, um, you know, within a neighborhood. And so um, with that, it makes it really important that we engage with the community and that we let them know, you know, what's going on, understand their concerns, making sure that we're providing opportunities for feedback. And so those are some of the things that are really important to us as we proceed through the project is making sure that they understand what's happening, making sure that we're being transparent and authentic, 
throughout every stage of the process. And then of course, looking for that feedback to come in as well. So there's a few different ways that we're gonna do that. One of them is through um, a website. It's not launched yet, but we're uh, putting, putting some uh, finishing touches on it here this week and it, it'll be live within the next few days here. Um, but this website is really gonna be designed to be um, with the home base, I guess. So it's more of a reference point where, um, you know, residents who are interested in this process um, and what's happening, they can come here and they can look and see at any time, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and understand what the latest is that's happening. Um, and then with that too, um, you know, we're trying to answer some of the questions and some of the concerns that we've already heard and making sure, again, relying on that transparency, authenticity, um, making sure that, that we're, you know, providing answers to those questions in a way that is, um, you know, understandable, <laughs> it's, it's relatable to the public. Um, another way that we're, we're engaging uh, with the community too is through group engagement. Um, there is an existing group, Visions of Cullen Park, um, that has already had some dialogue about this um, about this issue, and uh, there's some relationships that are forming there um, to maintain that communication and, and open lines of um, you know updates and things like that. And then um, in addition to that, we're going to be um, developing an advisory committee that is specific to this project or to these two projects. Um, and that group is will be comprised of residents who are in the area and um, we'll meet with them on a regular basis and, and you know let them know what we're working on ask for feedback ask what questions they might have um, you know as as Sally had mentioned at the end at the beginning um, some of the focus of these projects is on the recreational opportunities and no one knows that better than those residents and so we want to make sure that we've always got a pulse on that and how anything that we're doing with these wetlands will impact the recreation um, John mentioned a couple times that um, we're, we're, we are planning a couple of public meetings. Um, structure of them might be evolved a little bit because of um, COVID-19 as we're all adjusting to, to what the new normal looks like here. Um, but at those meetings, we want, really want to make sure that it's a valuable use of, um, of the public's time. And so um, we'll be sharing out actual concepts, actual um, you know, designs, layouts, potential options for what those wetlands might look like, and then also make sure, again, that we have that opportunity to, um, to, to have further dialogue and, and deeper conversation with residents in that area as well. And then um, media relations will be another point here, um, you know, letting, letting more of the masses know um, about the status of these projects and, and where we're headed. So we really see two touch points when we um, anticipate doing media outreach on this project. Um, one is when we have initial concepts and then of course when we have the final design completed and when of course we'll react to media as needed um, as we go throughout the project. So. That is our presentation for today. Um, it's a great opportunity to uh, present to all of you and um, our contact information is there on the slide if you can read it. I know it's a little small, but um, that's what we've got for today. Well, uh, Sally, John, Kelly, thank you so much. Great presentation, uh, neat projects. Uh, as I said earlier, we've got about 10 minutes and we'll field any questions. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat box in case any questions come in through the chat box. Um, one question that I had just to get it started. Um, I, I see that you're going to be um, ensuring boat passage um, through the uh, Grassy Island wetlands. How will the ma long-term management plans help to ensure that long-term boats are able to pass through that passage? Um, I, can, I can address that. We've had some conversations um, about that issue and um it's our understanding as the project team that you know the those channels will continue to be dredged periodically as needed but the other thing is that you know one of the things limotech talked about was you know hydraulically if there may be a way to design and configure this so that through natural flow some of that might take care of itself and maintain itself but we we're still looking at that 
but um, absent a natural preservation through some natural hydraulic process, I would imagine that they will be, you know, periodically dredged. All right, thanks, John. Um, Sandy Bidden did submit a question through the chat box. Uh, what is the estimated range of phosphorus reduction for these projects? I wish, I, I'm trying to remember the number that Scott, well, we don't have the estimated range yet because of the modeling that has not been completed, but I know that when there was H2 Ohio money um, sought after on that, I do recall, and I can get the information for you, Sandy, um, Scudder Mackey developed some initial estimates and that's what we would, we would want to go on at this point subject to adjustments from the modeling, but I'll have to get you that information and provide it to you. All right, and another question in the chat box, uh, how much flow from the Maumee River passes through Grassy Island Cullen Pathway? Currently, it's, it's, it's not, if you look at the percentage of flow, you saw that graphic that showed most of that water does head out into the bay. Knowing that, um, I don't know what the current percentage is. Limnotech could probably answer that for you. But one of the things we clearly recognize, and we've are already been kind of noodling around with it, is that we may have to provide some additional diversionary structures or jetties or whatever down near the southern end there to help divert more flow through that area so that's all part of the design process is to make that evaluation and see how we can enhance that if we want to increase that flow through the area And I don't have any more questions in the chat box, so I'm wondering if there's anyone who would like to unmute their mic and ask any questions of our presenters. All right, um, actually I have one more question. Um, when uh, Director Mertz, uh, Director of ODNR was presenting on these projects, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, um, she had mentioned that there will be some monitoring for all of the H2 Ohio wetlands projects. Um, is that the case? I'm assuming that's the case for this project, and I'm wondering if you know anything about the long-term uh, monitoring of these projects. It is the case for this project. I can't say, I mean, I'm assuming it would be if, if she said that. I just don't know about the other projects because we're not working on any of those. Um, I do know that when the RFPs came out, I wasn't, um, I believe these, those will be add-on activities. Uh, right now, a lot of these other projects are going through initial design and design build contracts. So, but I don't recall that there were monitoring activities associated with the scopes of those design build contracts. So I believe that's, that's an add-on that ODNR will be providing um, after they're built. But, but you'd have to verify with ODNR. That's my understanding. Yeah, it sounds like they want to have some consistent monitoring across um, all H2 Ohio projects. Um, I do have one more question in the chat box. Uh, why Kent State instead of UT, uh, who monitors the Bay? I have no idea. <laughs> I was not part of those conversations. I will tell you this, I've seen multiple, when I was out at Cullen Park Bay, Oh, last spring, the I saw both. I think I saw. I, I don't remember exactly what university it was from, but I think there are more universities out there doing work than we probably know. Um, and I don't know why. You know, if there's specific research projects or what. But well, thank thank you, John Kari. I, John, I I have one quick question for you. Uh, Given the high water levels and the various predictions from various government agencies on when the water levels might start to recede, uh, how does that affect the design? Uh, 
involving the wetlands? That's a that's a really good question. Right now, we're 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 sort of basing our we're we're basing our our reference elevation for like the tops of any barriers or berms at just about or somewhere near the current higher water elevations. And obviously, as the long term cycles start to the water levels start to decline, those will become over the years. You know, obviously they're gonna they're gonna show up more when the water levels drop and they're gonna they're gonna so the water levels are gonna go up and down and that is one of the challenges that we're dealing with is how do you design for something that on on you know whatever the cycle is um it's bound to go down eventually so there's gonna be change out there it's not gonna be static with time and you know we're gonna have to address that um but that is something that we're dealing with um and right now we're just we're using that that current water, the current water elevation, sort of as our design reference. All right. Well, thank you, John. You're um, welcome. If, if there are no further questions, let's uh, move on to our next agenda item, which is our uh, update uh, for the agenda for Lake Erie. I know that all of our water quality council committees have been working hard on this, as well as the uh, as the staff. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing uh, Kari's update. Thanks, John. Um, I also uh, wanted to mention, I noticed um, in the sign-in box that we've uh, got a representative from uh, Senator Sherrod Brown's office with us today, Erica Krause, thanks for joining us. And Joy Mellonex, the director of the Ohio Lake Erie Commission. Um, thank you for joining us. And I wonder if uh, either of you would like to say, say anything before I get started. Hi, this is Erica Krause from Senator Sherrod Brown's office. Um, this is uh, my first water quality meeting. I started with the office in March. Um, I would imagine that most of you know Ann Longsworth Orr with our office. Um, she uh, now has a statewide role with our group. Um, so I've taken over for Northwest Ohio. Um, the health of Lake Erie and projects like this one continue to be a high priority for Senator Brown. Uh, we know how important Lake Erie is to life for everyone in Northwest Ohio um, and for the entire state of Ohio. So we're going to keep uh, continue to be a partner with you all in making sure that we're taking care of our, our lake and our resource. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to meet all of you in person one day when we get back to that, but I'm happy to join virtually until then. Thank you. Great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Joy, are you still on the line? I am still here. Thank you. Um, I was uh, enjoying the overview of um, two of the H2 Ohio projects. And, um, you know, I think with that great presentation, you know, it's easy to see how water quality is a part of, you know, so many issues that Team ACOG and and all of your cities are are working on because you know yes they are water quality projects but you know they're also um, dealing with recreation and um, community engagement and and so many um, other aspects of life and so um, appreciate all of the interest in in those projects and um, Lake Erie in general so um, thank you for focusing on on those projects during this meeting. Great, right. thank you, Joy. And thank, thanks to both of you for your kind words. Um, right now, we're going to uh, talk a bit about the agenda for Lake Erie, and both of you may have seen this uh, document that we put together uh, beginning in 2017 and 2018. It uh, lays out uh, Team McCogg's water quality policy agenda, and we use this as a tool to um, help engage uh, legislators and uh, this the state administrations of Ohio and Michigan. So uh, the way that the agenda for Lake Erie is laid out is we've got several uh, different policy agendas um, and they're listed here. And each of our committees is in charge of uh, helping to update and uh, keep, uh, make sure that all of the uh, policy recommendations are current within each of these agendas. 
So the purpose of the agenda for Lake Erie is to give our members a voice in our water quality priorities. Uh, our water quality issues here are obviously uh, very different from elsewhere in the state. So uh, this allows our members and folks from across the Western Basin to um, provide, provide input on policies that our region thinks will uh, help to improve uh, some of the issues that we're seeing primarily with the algae bloom. And we, again, uh, the first version of this was uh, put out in uh, 20, 2018, and uh, we've been using that as a foundation for um, advocacy on behalf of our members. So the way each of these policy agendas are broken down, um, and we don't need to get into too much detail here, but I just wanted to let you know that they're broken down by a very short overview um, that really is not at all all inclusive. It just gives a very quick background of each of our subject areas um, and then jumps right into the state and federal policies and then um, uh, policy recommendations and then also makes recommendations for what local elected officials and folks at the regional level can do to um, help improve the situation. Um, and then, of course, we also focus on funding needs. Here is a schedule for update. Now, if any of you have seen the schedule at previous um, water quality meetings, you'll see that it's changed a bit. Um, we are currently uh, working with all of our committees. Actually, we worked with our committees in May and June, and we incorporated all of their input. Um, those draft policy um, documents were sent to all of you with the meeting announcement for this meeting. So hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at that. Um, next step is to um, engage our stakeholders. So um, we will be sending out the uh, original policy documents to our stakeholder group. Um, we didn't do this the first time around. Uh, we didn't. We had a decent stakeholder group, but now that we're two years in, we have a much better idea of who would be uh, interested in providing um, feedback. So there is some overlap between our membership and um, the stakeholders. So some of you might be actually seeing the request for um, input twice. Uh, so uh, we're requesting some input from stakeholders, and then we will take everything that we receive and um, review and update the documents. Uh, something else new this time around is that we will be engaging the public in this update. Uh, we will not be uh, uh, hosting an official public comment period. Uh, this document does not require that, but we do want to use this document as a way to um, reach out to the general public and um, advocacy groups and uh, let them know what our regional priorities are. Um, if we do hear some some feedback from them, that's great. Um, we will certainly consider that as we're um, finalizing our drafts. Uh, so by November, we should have all of this complete and ready for Water Quality Council approval. And then from there, we'll move pretty quickly through um, the Executive Committee, Timacock Executive Committee, and the Board of Trustees. And then we're really excited to roll this new agenda out um, along with TMACOG's transportation legislative agenda at our 2021 General Assembly in January. Um, and we don't quite know what that's going to look like yet. If that is an in-person uh, General Assembly, then um, it'll look very differently from if we end up doing a web-based General Assembly. So uh, real quick here, I've listed out again the different policy agendas and the committees that were um, in charge of the updates. Um, again, all of our committees have provided updates, so now we are presenting it to um, Water Quality Council to uh, weigh in on the two policy briefs that uh, we uh, are, that are really driven by Water Quality Council. So that is the legal tools for addressing algal blooms and the impairment designation. Um, before we jump into um, getting all of your input, I do want to um, go over the, um, the feedback that was given to us by our committees. So we'll actually be starting with some of our uh, committee um, updates first. Uh, but I will, I will note that um, when I say impairment designation, uh, that was the uh, title of the 
um, policy brief dealing with the impairment designation just immediately after Ohio EPA had um, declared the Western Lake Erie Basin impaired um, back in 2018. So we're looking for that policy um, agenda to actually um, focus more in the future on how to go about implementing a TMDL. So we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so uh, quickly here, I wanted to just go over uh, the feedback that we got from our different committees. So we'll jump right into agenda three, which is um, stormwater management. Uh, some of the feedback that we got from um, the Stormwater Coalition is uh, that we need to make some updates to that agenda based on a new construction general permit. They also provided some, uh, just some wording edits uh, just to kind of clean up some of the language. And one suggestion that I wanted to pass along to the rest of our committees and Water Quality Council is that they would like to see us kind of prioritize the different policy recommendations within each of the policy briefs and note you know, which ones um, are a, a top priority, which ones have actually been complete, but are still worth mentioning, and then which of those need outreach. So uh, that's something that I'd like to get your input on. And uh, if this is something the group would like us to do, uh, staff could take a look at how to prioritize those. Um, so next steps on the staff review side, um, we will be incorporating um, any updates to the MS4 or the uh, uh, stormwater permit for, um, I'm sorry, can you all hear me? It, it, I think I may have just lost my audio. And I can't see anyone's reaction. You're still there, Kari. Okay, good, thank you. I, I had a glitch, so I wanted to make sure. Um, so staff will be uh, reviewing the new um, uh, permit for regulated MS4s and incorporating any of uh, that information into the policy agenda. And um, we're also looking at how to include some language for um, requiring maintenance plans, long-term maintenance plans for green infrastructure. At any point, please feel free to stop me if there's anything that needs clarification. Uh, the Agenda four is a focus on natural drainage systems. And um, so the watersheds committee uh, focused on, uh, on this policy agenda along with the stormwater coalition. Um, there were some changes in the language. Um, initially, uh, the language said something to the effect of um, requiring green infrastructure, but now we're looking at, um, for a number of different reasons, um, just incentivizing green infrastructure. Um, because that seems to be more effective than requiring. Um, however, there are um, requirements within the construction general permit for to manage stormwater on site. So there's still that requirement piece. Um, and then we, I won't get into all of these details because you've all got the, um, the edited versions in front of you or you've received them through email. Um, but I will say that we've also looked at how to um, incorporate elements of H2 Ohio into this policy agenda as well. And uh, at the staff level, we will be uh, looking at um, any active watershed related le legislation or policy changes that we can incorporate and also look at how we can incorporate um, Ohio EPA's approach to the TMDL. On the drinking water and wastewater side, um, we got quite a bit of uh, feedback actually from our committees. Uh, one of the uh, bigger uh, comments was that we really should focus less on the wording uh, public water supply and just call this drinking water. So that was a really great suggestion. I think um, Sandy Bennett suggested that. And I think this will allow us to um, use this as a tool to better outreach to the general public and folks that don't necessarily use language like public water supply. Um, uh, there was also a suggestion to um, kind of clean up that agenda a little bit by breaking out separate um, policies for drinking water and wastewater. So we're looking at doing that. And they had a lot of other suggestions on including um, things like emerging contaminants of concern, a beneficial reuse of residuals, um, including asset management plans and emergency preparedness. Of course, um, very important um, 
and we're all realizing this with uh, with COVID and other issues. Um, and one other suggestion was um, to include some language about um, making a priority outreach to um, say high school students and folks uh, looking for jobs about the opportunities for public sector jobs in water and wastewater. Um, on the staff side, we will be looking at how to incorporate um, a specific uh, piece of legislation that I think is in the Senate right now, um, House Bill 163. Uh, so we'll be looking at that and then um, we will also look at some, I think there was a new funding bill that Congress passed. Um, perhaps later, John Hall can tell us a little bit about that. Um, but if there's anything that needs to be incorporated as far as uh, prioritizing that funding for Northwest Ohio, we'll include that as well. Um, there wasn't a whole lot that needed to be changed as far as um, home sewage treatment systems, uh, as far as our recommendations. I know um, the wastewater committee uh, provided a lot of great guidance back in 2018 and not a whole lot has changed that we were made aware of. So. Um, if anyone from this committee uh, has anything they would like us to um, update as far as HSTS, please let me know. Um, at the staff level, we'll be looking at uh, to see if there's any opportunity to uh, pull some of these um, existing um, recommendations into our uh, regional planning documents and in turn also see if these regional planning documents can help to inform the um, policy agenda. And uh, finally, the Agriculture Committee uh, provided input on the agriculture uh, policy agenda. Now, when we first uh, developed this policy agenda back in 2018, we didn't have an Agriculture Committee. Um, we had a lot of the same stakeholders uh, working with us through the Watersheds Committee, but we've also, since then, just last year, um, launched a new agriculture committee with stakeholders from Ohio and Michigan. We've got a lot of producers at the table. So we were able to really get some robust feedback from this group um, and kind of clarified and cleaned up some language um, that made it, made this policy agenda more specific. And um, we're also able to um, apply this language to um, both Ohio and Michigan. Um, I think the initial policy brief focused more specifically on Ohio. And of course, the, the focus of this agenda is um, now more on um, local collaboration. So what we will be doing as far as staff is going in and looking at how we can update and make other recommendations uh, for this policy brief based on the H2 Ohio program, as well as the Ohio Agriculture Conservation Initiative. So that was um, a very quick overview of the feedback we've received from our committees. Um, is there any question before I um, jump into what I'm hoping to get uh, Water Quality Council's feedback on? Okay. Again, feel free to interrupt at any time. So, um, we would like to get Water Quality Council's feedback on uh, two policy briefs, um, one of them being the impairment designation. Um, as I mentioned, um, Ohio EPA did announce in their 2020 integrated report that um, they will be pursuing a TMDL in the next two, two to three years for the Western Lake Erie Basin. So this is a great opportunity for us to really refine this uh, policy brief to focus on what what we think that should look like um, specific to um, our region. Um, we also know a lot more now about um, Ohio EPA's Annex 4 targets and what they call far field waste load allocations. Um, so we will, um, staff will take a look at those um, uh, different priorities and see how we can pull them into our uh, policy brief. And really, I, I envision that this could focus on how a TMDL could be used to um, help control nutrient runoff. Oh, and I did actually skip over agenda one. 
Um, so agenda one, uh, legal tools. Um, we did get some feedback from uh, a few of our different committee members. Uh, one is that uh, we really should include the Safe Drinking Water Act as one of our legal tools and within that source water protection. Um, the legal tools brief does focus on the Clean Water Act and um, a lot of um, legal tools at the state level, but uh, really looking at um, the Safe Drinking Water Act as um, as a legal tool as well. And there were some changes to um, the distress designation um, as a legal tool that we'll need to incorporate. Um, if you remember back to 2018, there was discussion on um, declaring parts of the Western Basin, Basin as distressed. Doesn't sound like that's really part of the conversation now. So we'll be updating that, that section as well. And um, so as far as what staff will be doing to make sure this is up to date is I'm just kind of going through making sure that um, everything is still current and um, incorporating any new um, anecdotal information if it's helpful and uh, looking to see if it might be also a good idea to include Ohio EPA's um, response to the waters of the US rule rollback. So um, looking at their ephemeral streams permit. So in a nutshell, that's what staff will be looking at for each of the briefs. Um, overall, for across all agendas, we will uh, make sure that we are up to date on any pending legislation and incorporate um, all of that as needed. Um, Want to make sure that we're up to date with funding programs uh, such as H2 Ohio. And um, the big thing that I think we'll do is make sure that we have a um, good understanding of where we are as a region on each of the policy recommendations and um, I guess sort of prioritize those. We haven't worked that out yet, how that will be done. But again, that was a um, recommendation that came out of Water Quality Council. I'm sorry, that came out of the Stormwater Coalition. Um, that I think is worth pursuing. So with that, I would just like to open up the floor. I know um, all of you have received the um, policy briefs in Word format. Um, we sent those out with track changes so you could take a look at them. And um, if there are any of those policy briefs that you would like to um, weigh in on, or if you would like to um, provide some guidance on the first two, the legal tools and the impairment designation, um, now is a good time to do that. Um, we will also, of course, as always, be uh, taking your feedback and comments through email and um, you can give us a call as well. So um, I'm hoping that now that we've got all of you together in the same space, we can discuss some of these, uh, some of these changes. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. All right. Certainly, Carl, you hope to get some feedback today, but I would assume everybody has your email and uh, maybe have another chance to review the policy briefs and get comments back to us so that we can stay on schedule. Absolutely. Can I answer, uh, Ken, did you have a question? I see your hand, are you muted? I don't think I'm muted anymore. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I don't wanna take time long on this and I'm happy to uh, make comments off offline, uh, but in connection with the impairment, you're absolutely right that that needs to be updated because OEPA has said they're gonna do it, the TMDL. But the point I wanted to make is that even if they're doing a TMDL, and that's great to give them guidance on how to implement that, is that the TMDL alone is not going to provide additional authority and that we shouldn't wait uh, to the end of the TMDL to be acting on additional recommendations for the state to be doing other things, including legal tools uh, to address nutrient pollution. And so uh, I'm happy to weigh in after this, but that was the main point that I wanted to uh, mention up front. Thank you, Ken. I'll definitely follow up with you. Um, I'll also mention that the, the legal tools section is heavily references a document that uh, Ken Kilbert uh, worked on, was that back in 2017, listing out all of the um, 
uh, not all of the legal tools, but a lot of legal tools uh, for addressing um, issues in the Western Lake Erie Basin. So if there's anything else you'd like to add, Ken. Yeah, that was 2015, Kari, so oh, it goes back wow. that far. <laughs> all right. Well, Ken, we always appreciate your voice at the table. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything they would like to add? Um, I do see a comment really quick. Um, there is a question Sandy had asked, Sandy Ben had asked, um, in the ag section, will commercial fertilizer be broken out? Um, I don't know if there's anyone from the ag committee on the call right now who would like to weigh in or Sandy, if you'd like to, if there's anything you'd like to um, like to add to that. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay, um, so I should have read commercial fertilizer and manure as opposed to just agriculture. That was really the question and I just didn't finish the typing. And I can also review and make comments or ask questions otherwise. Okay, great. Thanks, Sandy. So, so you were wondering if there was going to be um, in the policy briefs a distinction between um, commercial fertilizer and manure. Right. That... As to what, the, what the rules and regulations are for each. Okay. Wondering if actually... Oh, I think I lost you. You faded out. Oh, I can't hear you now, Sandy. All right, well, I'll, I'll follow up with you. I'm gonna leave myself a note to follow up with you on that question. And we'll also uh, run that through the Agriculture Committee as well. Um, one thing to note is that once we do incorporate um, feedback from Water Quality Council and our stakeholders, we will be sending these uh, back through our committees. Uh, that will likely be through email. Um, I'm not sure what our meeting schedules look like and if we're going to be able to stay on track doing it through meeting, but we will send all of these through email back to our committees. Did anyone from the Ag Committee have anything to add or have an answer to Sandy's question? Okay. All right, well, thank you all. And um, if you have anything um, you would like to add to any of the policy briefs, and then definitely looking for guidance on those first two, number one and number two. Um, I would love to hear your comments and guidance. So you all know how to get a hold of me through email. Um, so go ahead and start sending those my way. Um, at the same time, like I said, we'll be incorporating stakeholder feedback. So uh, we do have some time on this. So I'd say over the next few weeks, if we can start getting that feedback, it would be greatly appreciated. Well, thank you, Kari. Some, some, something tells me you're going to be getting comments. Uh, I hope so. If we're done with the uh, with the agenda, let's move on to staff and committee reports. And uh, Kari, I, I would I would like to welcome Matt to the Team of Cog family. I have not seen him for quite some time. He's a wonderful asset, and I hope we all get to know him better. Kari, you're muted. Yeah, I just realized that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I wanted to reiterate the big welcome to Matt Kennedy. Uh, most of you uh, may have met him at other um, uh, water quality meetings over the last few months, but Matt started at Team Macog as a water quality planner um, in the middle of May. Uh, this was a position that was vacant for about six months, so we are so excited to have him on board. Um, already, he's been uh, reaching out to all of our um, wastewater communities, asking for their updates on the 208 plan. Um, I'm happy to report that he's heard back from almost everybody, um, and it's usually a challenge uh, getting getting some responses. So he's doing a great, great job, and I'm actually going to um, turn it over to him in just a moment to begin with our committee and staff updates. So let me share my screen really quick.
All right, so uh, John and Melissa thought that in the interest of time today, um, that it would be best to have staff give our um, committee updates. So we're going to do that while also giving staff updates uh, within the same little presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Matt to um, give updates from the wastewater and public water supply committees. Thanks, Kari, for introducing me to everyone. I'm very happy to be working with Team ACOG and really getting moving on all the different projects we have going on here. I uh, apologize for not having my camera on. It seems that everyone is trying to use the internet right now at my apartment complex, so I kind of have to have those turned off so that I can hear everyone in an appropriate way. So what I wanted to first go over was talking about the wastewater committee and what the different things we've had going on with that so far. Uh, for the past couple of months, I've been working on a biosolid white paper, and that's kind of that's getting towards the end stages of being finalized and going through final reviews. In addition, one of the big things we were able to do right when I came on board was to offer water and wastewater operator training webinars and a COVID roundtable. I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, Jones and Hendry Engineers for sponsoring those. Uh, we're able to offer continuing education credit hours, and it's been a bit of a challenge for people to be able to get those hours with the COVID um, shutdown we've had going on with these and interruptions. So we've been able to provide these classes and to have a number of different opportunities for operators to get those contact hours. And it's one of those things where now that we have the infrastructure in place, we may be able to offer more of those going forward as it seems like things aren't necessarily going to, you know, we're not going to be able to have any more, any in-person opportunities anytime soon. And also, as Kari had mentioned, the been working on the 208 plan updates and getting in contact with all of the different facility planning areas and <laughs> determining whether they have changes or not for this coming year. I have back 44 out of 48 of those. So it seems like I've been able to get a lot of good response from people to be able to determine what updates or not they have for this, uh, this upcoming year. Those are going to, the next step for those plans is to go through uh, county level um, committee reviews, and then they'll finally be sent on through the wastewater committee and these different committees before final team ACOG approval and that's moving towards the fall. And the next committee meeting for the wastewater will be August 5th. If you want to move on to the next slide, Kari. And then for the public water supply committee, again, this kind of ties in with some of those operator trainings since some of those credits were for um, water, for drinking water, and some of them were for wastewater and that seemed to go very well. We've had a great response for them providing that and doing that service. Uh, in the June meeting, we were talking about the HAVS monitoring uh, by NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. And as everyone knows, that's a major you know, issue in you know, the Western Lake Erie Basin with these harmful algal blooms. And it's really you know, critical to be able to determine these monitorings and uh, modeling to be able to see the forecasts for what's going to be coming up in the uh, current year and, you know, be able to determine how we can make changes in response to managing that. Um, on the good news that it's on a scale, normally these are rated on a scale of 1 to 10, and this year is looking to be about a 5. So hopefully it'll be kind of not too severe, but something where there may still be some issues and you know, requires monitoring regardless. In addition, uh, there's some house bill funding from looking into with the $11 billion in emergency supplemental funding for drinking water. And the next meeting of that uh, public water supply committee will be September 3rd. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, actually, the, the information that we uh, got on the um, emergency supplemental funding uh, came through John Hall's office. So I wonder, John, if there's anything that you would like to add um, on that on that funding? Um, <clears throat> sure. Just be stay tuned. Stay tuned for the details. Uh, there will probably be a lot of negotiation um, on that on that funding, how it actually gets implemented. 
Uh, there will be attempts to direct it to communities to replace existing programs or funding for existing programs. So I'm not sure, um, well, I am sure that no one should anticipate that this will provide $11 billion of um, funding for new programs or uh, pre-existing initiatives. Some of it's got to go to uh, status quo programs, I think. But there'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of uh, a change before this finally gets down to the states and the cities for uh, distribution. And uh, but it's better than nothing, you know. It's good to have some attention to to the topic. But I think that that's uh, about all I should say about that for right now. Okay, thanks, John. And um, this is some funding that we will be uh, keeping track of. And um, if if we can, uh, through the policy brief for water and wastewater, uh, we will uh, reference that as well. Okay, so um, on to the Stormwater Coalition update. Um, this group has been very busy uh, working with staff on this project um, for good housekeeping. Um, Stormwater Coalition members are all required to train their staff on um, different practices that municipal staff can use to uh, prevent stormwater pollution. So this is part of their stormwater permit and um, something that TMACOG has done in the past is provide um, educational materials. And those were uh, usually in the way of uh, presentations that we would provide on site and posters. Um, However, uh, things change over the years and we found that you know, providing something a little more flexible for our members was going to be uh, more useful. So we put together a uh, video series that we are just wrapping up uh, this week actually. Um, so these will be available to um, any jurisdiction who has uh, staff that they need to train on stormwater, uh, stormwater protection. Uh, we've also got some posters that we've created and updated and um, we're really looking forward to rolling those out the next meeting on July 16th. Um, we did cancel our April meeting uh, because of the uncertainty uh, with the pandemic, but uh, we did continue to meet with Stormwater Action Group, and we also had a special presentation that was uh, provided to Stormwater Coalition members in May on post-construction and green infrastructure maintenance plans. So that was a really valuable presentation. Um, we don't have that one posted on our website yet, but we will, and I recommend that you check that out. Uh, so yeah, our next meeting is gonna be July 16th, and uh, we will have John Matthews from Ohio EPA uh, presenting at that meeting. It'll be a web-based meeting, of course, and he will be talking about the uh, long-awaited uh, permit renewal for the MS4 permit. Uh, Sarah Geyer has been uh, working with the Watersheds Committee, and I'm going to do my best to give her update today. She's on a much needed vacation in the Upper Peninsula right now, so um, she gave me a few notes. Um, the Watersheds Committee has been uh, busy uh, working on the Agenda for Lake Erie update. Um, they actually held a work session. Um, this group has been sort of steering the non-point source implementation strategy uh, working group. Um, and they did decide, of course, in March to cancel um, or postpone the workshop that they had planned. Um, they had a, a great workshop plan that was going to um, not only educate local folks on the importance of these, what we call NIPSIS plans, um, but also folks across the entire watershed. So unfortunately, we had to cancel that. Um, and we're looking at rescheduling that for sometime in spring. Hopefully, that'll give us enough time to um, get together as a group. And um, also wanted to mention that the Student Watershed Watch program is still going strong, although we're not able to get folks together for training. Um, Sarah has a virtual training program um, scheduled um, using a webinar platform. And she's also putting together some uh, really uh, robust um, video materials uh, for teachers and students to use. So we'll be rolling those out pretty soon here. Uh, the next meeting of the Watersheds Committee will be on July 22nd, and uh, Sandra from Partners for Clean Streams will be presenting on what they've been doing to continue to engage communities on environmental and water quality education uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the Agriculture Committee has also been uh, pretty busy updating and reviewing the Agenda for Lake Erie uh, policy briefs. 
Um, they also held a work session. I believe they had a meeting that was canceled as well. Um, I think that would have been the April meeting. Now they're looking at hosting a um, possible virtual tour for the next meeting. So when this group um, originally convened, they decided that it would be a great idea uh, rather than sitting in a boardroom or uh, some other meeting space four times a year to kind of break it up. So they're planning on two regular meetings, but two um, site tours um, for this year. Um, as you know, it's going to be difficult to get out on site, so um, Mike Libin is looking into some options for a virtual tour. So more to come on that. I'm excited to see what they come up with. Um, now, the Portage River Basin Council isn't actually a subcommittee of Water Quality Council, but I did want to keep you updated. Um, Sarah has been working with the Portage River Basin Council and a really robust um, group of um, Portage River stakeholders uh, to get the Portage River designated as a water trail. Uh, this has been in the works for the last couple of years, and we were really pretty convinced that with the, the state funding cuts that this project would be on hold. But I'm happy to announce that phase one has been funded. So what that will pay for is the design work for uh, signage for the water trail and for brochures. And um, that is underway right now. And it's looking like phase two will also likely be funded. And that will actually pay for the printing of the signage um, or printing of brochures and installation of the signage. So uh, we are really excited to see that moving forward, um, especially in a time when you know we're really seeing people do a lot more things outdoors and you know getting them out on our local rivers is a great way to um, to keep people engaged in water quality and um, get them outdoors. So, we're still um, looking at a public launch. Uh, we were initially planning to launch the water trail this year. Obviously that won't be happening, but we are looking at doing that next year. So again, really excited to see that moving forward. And with that, uh, that wraps up our committee and staff updates. And we can, between Matt and I, I think we can answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kari. I'd like to say that uh, Perrysburg uh, was one of the uh, participating communities in the Maumee River Water Trail, and I it was uh, spearheaded that effort for the city in my role as Director of Public Service, but uh, it has been a huge success and people enjoy it immensely. It's a great way to get out and enjoy a, a resource that uh, probably a little bit underutilized for the most part, so. Uh, Moving on, do we have any public comments? Hearing none, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our three speakers. Uh, a great presentation. Thanks for putting in such hard work. Always want to thank the staff. They, they make the Water Quality Council work. Uh, all of you for showing up today. And uh, Eric and Joy, we always appreciate your continued participation and support at the Water Quality Council. So looking forward to see you down the road. 